our next topic the book discusses as opening up the moral reference class. This is on page 32. The moral reference class, so let's define terms first. The moral reference class refers to the class of everything that has intrinsic value. So extrinsic value might be something that doesn't have intrinsic value but is useful to you, it has use value to you. Um, so let's say you don't care all about the well-being of trees but you like trees because you can cut them down to use to, to, to get lumber to build a house. So such a person would find uh, certainly value in trees, but it wouldn't be intrinsic value, it'd be extrinsic value. So the moral reference class consists of everything which has intrinsic value, value in and of itself, um, value that doesn't depend on being useful for something else. And the idea of opening up the moral reference class is to ask who is a member of the moral reference class. So at one point the moral reference class consisted only of let's say to use an American example, American historical example, um, of people who weren't enslaved, uh, generally speaking white people. Um, and then after the Civil War it was extended to, uh, there was no slavery anymore, uh, to include people of all races, but not necessarily equally, at least legally, until the 1960s. So that's an, a historical example of making the moral reference class bigger, expanding it, uh, opening it up in the book's language. Now, the question is, to what extent do people want to open up the moral reference class even more? Or maybe a better way to phrase this is there different people had different beliefs about how large the moral reference class should be. So there's some people who would want to include future generations as part of the moral reference class so that they have intrinsic value and we have ethical duties to them even if they don't have any ethical duties to us, even though it's not it's not inst in, in, instrumental for us. We still have an ethical obligation to them. Well, how about animals? Uh, there are certainly people that think that animals belong in the moral reference class, at least some animals. And then you can ask about what kind of animals. You know, Maybe mammals belong in the intrinsic uh, in the more reference class, but uh, birds don't, or maybe animals and uh, uh, maybe I didn't say that right. Maybe mammals belong in the in, um, moral reference class, but birds don't, or maybe mammals and birds both belong in the moral reference class, but uh, but worms don't, or mollusks don't, or maybe they do. Um, and of course, there's some people that think that no animals belong in the moral reference class. Uh, making things even bigger. Some people think that plants belong in the moral reference class. At least some plants, perhaps a large tree or a tree that you know has been alive for a thousand years. Maybe that belongs in the moral reference class. How about ecosystems? Do ecosystems belong in the moral reference class? Even some people argue that some non-living things belong in the moral reference class. Do we have an obligation, let's say, to keep a famous uh, mountain the way uh, nature has it and not put uh, a, a strip mine on the mountain and thereby permanently change the way the mountain looks? Now, there's no right answer to the question of what should and should not be in a moral reference class. But it's one way of distinguishing between different ethical positions vis-a-vis -vis the environment is what one particular person versus another does or does not put in the, moral, in the moral reference class or does or does not argue should be in the moral reference class. So next point here on page 38, objections to making decisions based on human values. Uh, 
number one, it's hard to measure willingness to pay and willingness to accept. Uh, we can certainly agree with that. We've uh, we've studied willingness to pay and willingness to accept quite a bit, unlike somebody who would have read chapter two at the very beginning of such a course. I, I think I've argued that uh, yes, it's hard to measure these things, but they don't seem to give numbers that are totally random. And if you argue it's too hard to measure these, that raises the question of, well, then what, what would you do instead? But in any case, that's one argument that some people make, that they're too hard to measure, and so we shouldn't even try, or they're useless in decision making. Number two, environmental decisions should not depend at all on what's good for humans. This is a pretty extreme position and I don't think you'd find any economists that would be advocating it. Uh, when you think of economics as a social science, it's the science of people and so uh, I think the vast majority of economists or maybe all economists would think that uh, the, the implications of an environmental decision for people is certainly something that ought to be taken into account. So. Uh, number three, oh, let me fix that, the numbering mistake. Okay, so number three, environmental decisions should not depend only on what's good for humans. So that's a question of, does the moral reference class only include humans, or does it include other things besides humans? So when, when we talk about box 2.1 here, uh, which distinguishes different kinds of ethical positions, uh, we'll see echoes of of this uh, of these three uh, objections here in those different ethical positions. Uh, finally, page um, thirty nine brings up a point of needs versus wants. Economists, for the most part. Uh, let me say neoclassical economists for the most part, don't make a distinction between needs and wants. They simply ask people what would increase their utility and uh, leave it up to the people themselves to divide desires between the more important desires and the less important desires. But of course one might think of someone else, perhaps a social planner, making a decision or making a distinction between needs and wants and saying that wants, the needs are more important than wants and that first society is going to try to pay attention to satisfy everybody's needs and only after those are satisfied will society move to satisfying people's wants. So that's not a distinction which Neoclassical economists feel comfortable making, but from a non-neoclassical, from some non-neoclassical positions, it, it perhaps is it is something that could be considered. So the neoclassical social planner doesn't do anything like that. The neoclassical social planner just takes people's utility functions as given and doesn't ask any questions about where they came from or whether their utility functions are good or bad. But certainly there are other uh, philosophical positions that do want to interrogate people's utility functions and, and, and ask questions like needs or wants. There are even some that say, well, what about the utility function of an evil person? Do we want to maximize that? Uh, in fact, maybe the utility of an evil person, maybe we actually want to minimize uh, the utility of an evil person not maximize it. So there are other philosophical points of view that would want to interrogate individual utility functions instead of just say, well, we're just going to take whatever the individuals want. But neoclassical economists, for the most part, just take whatever individuals want without question. So, so the last video in this chapter is going to be about box 2.1, but that's going to be a separate video, so we'll stop this one right now.